In this episode, I wanted to talk about setting up an OpenFire XMPP server on CentOS. Let's say, for example, that you want to improve internal communication around the office. You might want to try an internal XMPP server, because it allows you to quickly chat with colleagues via instant message. XMPP was originally named Jabber, and you might remember Jabber because it was extremely popular in the late 90s, and it was used for sending instant messages, similar to MSN Messenger. Okay, now that we know a little bit about OpenFire, let's start the install. In this demo, as a starting point, I'm going to use a minimal version of CentOS 6.4 64-bit. I'm just going to cat the Etsy Red Hat release file so that you can see the version I'm working with. Before we install the OpenFire XMPP server, we need to satisfy a couple requirements. With a default CentOS release, IP tables will be running by default. So we need to poke a couple holes in the firewall to allow our XMPP traffic between the clients and our new server. Just to verify the firewall is active, I like to run IP tables dash capital L and then dash N, which lists the current firewall rule set. If you're not running IP tables, then you can safely skip this step. We're going to add two additional firewall rules. We do this by opening Etsy sysconfig IP tables in our editor. I'm just going to copy the line which allows incoming SSH connections and modify it to suit our needs. We're just going to change the destination port to 5222. This allows the XMPP traffic between the client and server. Next, we need to allow incoming traffic to port 9090. This allows access to the OpenFire administration console, which will be used to configure the OpenFire server. So now that we have our two additional rules, let's go ahead and save the file. Here I'm going to run iptables-restore and then input etsy sysconfig iptables, which basically feeds in our new rule set. Then we're going to run service iptables reload to refresh the rule set. Now we can verify the changes took place by running iptables-l-n again. As you can see, our new rules are active. Next, I'm going to install MySQL Server. This step is not required, as you'll see later, but I just wanted to review it just in case you're interested. First, you'll run yum install mysql-server. We'll use MySQL to store login data amongst other things. Once you have MySQL Server installed, we'll need to start it. You can do this by running service mysqld start. If you're doing this for the first time, a bunch of output will be displayed. The bulk of it relates to setting up a default password for the root MySQL account. Let's go ahead and set this password. I'll start by copying this line and entering a random string of numbers and letters, which we'll use as the password. Let's go ahead and log into MySQL using the root account and our new password. We are going to create a new database called OpenFire and configure a new account that can access it. This database will be used by the OpenFire XMPP server. Let's get started by running create database open fire. Then we will run create user open fire at localhost identified by and then the password. I should mention that I'm just copying and pasting, but I've also added these entries to the show notes below for your convenience. The next couple lines grant permissions to the open fire user on the open fire database. I think it's nice to create role accounts rather than running things under the root account simply because you can lock down access if required without disrupting other applications. In our final entry, we are going to flush the privileges to the database and then log out. I always like to verify that a service is listening on a port that I expect. You can do this by running netstat-nap and then pipe the output to grep capital L-I-S-T. This basically filters the netstat output and I'm looking for anything that has a listen line in it. You can see that we have MySQL and SSH daemons running. This 0.0.0.0 means they are listening on all available IPv6 addresses. If I know this MySQL server is not going to have external access, I like to modify the MySQL my.conf file to disable remote access. This just gives a little security measure to help prevent accidentally exposing your database to the internet. Let's go ahead and open up the etsy my.conf file. Under the MySQL section here, 
I'm going to add a bind dash address equals localhost. This setting tells MySQL to only listen on the localhost address. I'm going to save the file and then restart MySQLD to pick up the change. Next, let's rerun netstat nap with the grep filter to verify our change. As you can see, MySQL is now listening on localhost 3306, so the change worked. Okay, one last thing before we install the OpenFire XMPP server. If you're running a 64 bit system, like me, then you'll need to install the glibc.i686 package. Included in this package are some required libraries not installed on a 64-bit machine, which the OpenFire package needs to operate. Okay, we're now done with the prep work. Let's go ahead and install the OpenFire XMPP server. Let's head over to the OpenFire website. You can check out the show notes below for the website link. As you can see, OpenFire is a real-time collaboration server which uses the XMPP protocol, also referred to as Jabber. I chose OpenFire because it has a great admin interface, it's easy to use and configure, and because it has over 5 million downloads and seems very stable. Let's download OpenFire by heading over to the download page. OpenFire is cool in that it supports Windows, Linux, and Mac, but today we're going to download the Linux RPM package since we're using CentOS. I'm just going to copy the URL and then use wget from the terminal to download the package. Once you have the OpenFire RPM package downloaded, go ahead and install it by running rpm-ivh and then the package name. I always like to run rpm-query-list and then the package name. This will tell us what files were installed with the package. Since the output is quite large, I'll typically pipe the output to less, just to make it easier to navigate. In the resulting file list, you can see that we have an init script here, a sysconfig file, likely for runtime configuration settings, and it looks like the bulk of the OpenFire application is installed into the opt OpenFire directory. Let's just scroll down and see if there is anything else of interest. Here you can see that OpenFire comes with its own version of the Java runtime environment. Okay, that's about it. Let's go ahead and start OpenFire by running service OpenFire start and see what happens. You can also run service open fire status to see the current state. Yep, looks like it's running. Let's just verify by running netstat nap and then pipe the output to grep. Okay, so you can see we have MySQL, SSH, and then something running on port 9090. This is the open fire administration interface. Let's go ahead and open up a browser and point it at localhost colon 9090 and see what happens. Great, we're presented with the OpenFire interface. This is basically a wizard that helps us configure the server. First, we are asked to select the language. Next, you're asked to configure the domain. This will be the fully qualified domain name of your OpenFire server. For example, jabber.example.com. I'm going to use localhost since this is just a demo. Next you're asked to configure the database. You can use the embedded database which allows you to use OpenFire without MySQL or anything else. This option can be great if you don't have a high number of users. But since we installed MySQL, let's choose standard database connection. In this drop down we'll pick MySQL. Then these feeds will be populated with some default values which we can edit. We're going to modify the host name to be localhost, which is the machine we have MySQL installed on. Then we update the database name field. We're going to use OpenFire since this is the database we created earlier. We're going to enter the OpenFire username and password we created in the MySQL database earlier in this episode. On the next page, you're asked what type of authentication mechanism you'd like to use. Say for example that your company already has an existing LDAC directory. You could use that for authentication. We're just going to use the default option which will store the data in MySQL. Next we are prompted to enter the admin credentials for managing this server. Things like a admin email and the password. Okay, let's hit continue to save our configuration. Great, it says the setup is complete. Let's log in to the admin console. 
We just log in with the username admin and then the password we specified earlier. The default page will give you a little bit of information about the OpenFire server and the ports it is listening on. You might remember that we opened holes in the firewall for ports 5222 and 9090. The rest of these ports you don't really need to worry about, but you can review to add additional functionality. Let's jump over to the server settings page. Here there are many pages that we can use to configure the OpenFire server. You can also change any settings that we define during the setup. One page that I'd like to review is the registration and login page. The default settings are set to allow users to automatically create accounts and to log in anonymously. This essentially leaves your OpenFire server wide open so that anyone can connect. On an internal network this might not be a problem, but if say you're going to expose this to the internet, you might want to review these settings. Okay, now that we have OpenFire installed, let's flip over to my desktop where I've installed Pigeon, an open source communications client which supports many protocols. XMPP being one of them. This will let us test creating a new account on our OpenFire server. I'm going to create a new account by going to Accounts, Manage Accounts, and then clicking Add. Select the protocol, in our case XMPP. Enter a username, the domain. This is the fully qualified domain name of your OpenFire server, in my case localhost, and then choose a password. Then down here, select the Create New Account on the Server checkbox and click Add. Here we're asked if we'd like to accept the server's SSL certificate. I trust this server since we just created it, so I'll click Accept. You can modify the SSL certificate via the OpenFire admin interface. Say, for example, that you wanted to add one that you purchased or something. Now we're asked to fill in our new account details. Things like the username, full name, email, and a password. Cool, it looks like we've created the account on the server. This is Pigeon specific, but I usually click Enable checkbox so that my account will automatically connect when I start using Pigeon, but you can configure this how you like. Then we're prompted for a password to connect. Okay, looks like we're on. It's pretty lonely since we're the only user though. Okay, now that we've created our account, let's jump back to the OpenFire admin interface and see if anything has changed. Under the Users Groups tab, you can see that we have a new user called Justin and a little green icon showing that I'm online. You can also jump over to the Sessions tab to see all currently connected users, both anonymous and those who have created accounts. All right, that about wraps up this demo. One thing I'll usually do is make sure OpenFire and MySQL are started on boot. I do this by running check config, the service name, and on. Then I'll usually reboot the machine to make sure everything comes up as expected. I should mention that if you're looking for XMPP clients, you should check out Jabber.org, where they have a listing of some very popular ones for Windows, Linux, and Mac. I've included the link to Jabber.org in the episode notes below. All right, that concludes this episode. Thanks for watching. If you would like to get notified about future episodes, please subscribe to my mailing list. You can do this by going to the Get Notified link in the header and entering your email address. Have questions, comments, or concerns about this episode? What about episode ideas? I'd love to hear your feedback, either good or bad. Shoot me an email, justin at sysadmincasts.com.